So long before I moved to Denver, I grew up in suburban Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was lucky. My grandpa lived just an hour away in rural Indiana. We got to play together almost every weekend, building sandcastles, driving model trains, and tending his garden together. He was an integral part of my childhood, a self-made man and a World War II veteran who taught me the value of self-reliance and to finding joy in everyday moments. Fast forward 30 years, and now I have a family of my own, two little boys and a little girl. And they, too, have a very special grandpa, a founder of a real estate empire with so many lessons to share with his grandchildren. But tragically, he lives 18 hours away in Hong Kong. The travel time is simply prohibitive, and they get to see each other only once a year. So they'll never grow close. But it wasn't always this way. Amazingly, the airplanes we have today are no faster than the ones we had when my parents were growing up. We have failed to conquer geography. For most of human history, we lived and died no more than 20 miles from our birthplace, able to go only as far as our feet could carry us. But in a tiny sliver of history, we've made incredible progress. In the 1840s, if you lived in the eastern US and thought of going west, you took a covered wagon. The perilous journey took months, and you didn't visit, you moved, with no hope of ever coming back. In 1869, a breakthrough invention came to market, the, the Transcontinental Railroad. The journey that previously took months took just 83 hours via train. And now I know that might not sound like much by today's standards, but remember this. For the first time, a New Yorker could dream of going to California and actually coming home. <laughs> and progress continued to accelerate. In 1903, the Wright brothers built the first airplane. And just three decades later, we had transcontinental air service. The journey that stretched out 83 hours on the railroad shrank to just 20 hours on the propeller aircraft. But to really understand the value of speed, let's look closely at what happened when we went from propellers into the jet age. Now, in the 1950s, if you lived in San Francisco and you dreamed of a vacation in Hawaii, you'd have to get on one of these. That's right, it's a flying boat. The journey would take 16 hours, and once you learned that, you probably decided to vacation somewhere closer to home. <laughs> but the jet age changed all of this. The 16-hour flight shrank to just six hours, and all of a sudden, many more people began to choose a vacation in Hawaii. Travel to Hawaii skyrocketed sixfold in the first decade of the jet age, and it kept on growing as we built hotels, tourist attractions, and resorts. This distant, far-off state, Hawaii, exotic, remote, suddenly became accessible to the whole world. But it wasn't just about where you could go, it was also about what could come to you. The Beatles! <laughs> yes, the Beatles took the first world tour in 1964. A tour that would not have been practical just 10 years earlier with slower airplanes. And the jet age changed sports, too. Before the jet age, when a trip across the country would take most of a day, sports teams had to be clustered together in the east out of practical necessity. But when you could get across the country in six hours, all of a sudden we could bring Major League Baseball and Major League Football coast to coast. So next time you enjoy the big game, remember to give thanks to the jet. Its speed made it possible. And by the year 1969, it seemed like progress in aerospace was accelerating. In that year, after having been a decade behind in the space race, America landed a man on the moon for the first time and brought him home safely. And that same year, Concorde flew for the first time, the faster than the speed of sound supersonic airliner. It seemed like we were on the cusp of a new era of progress, that we could look forward to space exploration and ultra high speed travel. Concorde and the supersonics were supposed to be to the passenger jet what it had been to the propeller aircraft before it, and what those aircraft had been to the railroad still earlier. Aboard Concorde, the seven-hour journey from New York to London would shrink to just three and a half hours, fast enough that a New Yorker could do business in London and be home in time for dinner. You could fall in love with someone from another continent, and it would no longer matter if the relationship was long distance. 
Yet somehow, 50 years later, moon rockets and supersonic airliners are found only in museums. Concorde did fly for 27 years, but its fares were sky high, like $20,000 New York to London round trip. Few could afford to fly it, and it never changed mainstream transportation. And so in 2003, Concorde retired with no plan to replace it. And somehow the supersonic age had ended without ever really starting. Isn't this crazy? Where else in technology do we have something, lose it, and actually go backwards? To make sense of this, it helps to turn to the history of progress in aviation to see where big breakthroughs came from. Now, many of you know that the first airplane was invented by bicycle entrepreneurs who yearned to be in the air and thought there could be commercial potential for their invention. But what is less well known is that the first practical airliner, the Douglas DC-3, and the first jetliner, the de Havilland Comet, were also built by relatively young, founder-led companies. I.e., these airplanes were built by startups. <laughs> now, in envisioning the DC-3, Donald Douglas wanted a new airplane, which more people could fly on, which airlines could use to offer regular passenger service. And for himself, he thought he could sell thousands. That is, the requirement of commercial success necessitated the creation of a sustainable economic model. These airplanes had to make sense for their passengers, for the airlines, and for their manufacturers. Okay, well, what about supersonics? Well, Concorde didn't come from a startup, or even from an established company. It was a joint venture of two governments, France and Britain. After all, most joint ventures between the French and British have been wars. <laughs> so what was their goal? Well, it wasn't commercial success. The year was 1962. It was the height of the Cold War. And supersonic development was about beating the other guys into the supersonic age. Indeed, in the 1960s, supersonic projects were launched by governments in the US, in Europe, and in the Soviet Union. The Soviets actually made it into the air first, but their airplane had all kinds of problems. <laughs> and after hauling around a couple loads of mail, they shut it down. In 1971, the American supersonic competitor, which is funded by taxpayers and built by Boeing, was over budget and badly behind schedule. So Congress pulled the plug, leaving just Concorde still coming. Now in America, rather than embrace Concorde, we chose to block it. And the FAA imposed a literal speed limit over land in the US. A speed limit, really. So Concorde finally did arrive in 1976, but it was stillborn. We'd rushed into the age of supersonics, built it out of 1960s technology, which wasn't yet good enough for economical or efficient supersonic travel. The fares were too high. The aircraft flew mostly empty. And with transcontinental flights in the US banned, it had limited use. Only 14 were ever built and entered service. So there was no economy of scale. And in 2003, the fleet was retired, mainly for economic reasons. It become expensive to maintain, and Airbus stopped making spare parts, forcing both British Airways and Air France to ground their Concords. Now, as we stand here half a century later, the FAA's speed limit still stands, and it's had a crushing impact on progress. You might think that a supersonic renaissance would start with a small private jet for people who can afford to pay for speed, whose time is incredibly valuable. But the problem is most of those people want to fly over land. And so developers of private jets couldn't see a big enough market to justify the development costs. So thus we've had half a century of no progress in speed. Looking back, Concorde and Apollo share a common narrative. Both were amazing, inspiring technological achievements. But they were done in the pursuit of glory, not of commercial success. And thus, while we quite literally planted flags, we were free from the obligation to produce something of enduring value. These remarkable inventions looked like progress, but their actual result was decades of stagnation and regression. So in 2007, after Concord had retired, I was working at a startup, an internet startup in Seattle, 
Remember, that year the iPhone had just come out. And we were living in a world where our phones, our computers, and our communications were all getting faster. One day, my girlfriend was stuck on a slow, horrifically delayed flight. And while I waited for her, I started to wonder, whatever happened to faster travel? That day, I set a Google alert on supersonic jet because I figured a breakthrough had to be right around the corner. And I wanted to be the first to know when I could break the sound barrier. But it was crickets. There was no credible effort to build a supersonic jet that I could ever fly on. Just some crazy sci-fi concepts that wouldn't work and some talk of a private jet for billionaires. Nothing I could use. So I started to think, could one start a company to build supersonic jets? Could I start a company to build supersonic jets? I thought the answer would be no. The challenge seemed so daunting. After all, the American speed limit was still on the books limiting the market. And intercontinental airplanes are amongst the most complicated things ever built by humanity. They take years to develop, billions to come to fruition, and only a handful of gigantic multinational corporations can build them. But about three years ago, I decided I got to look at it anyway. And I thought I would do a couple weeks of research and get this supersonic craziness out of my system. But what I found instead was something really surprising and very exciting. It turns out that while we haven't had a speed up in 50 years, we have had half a century of progress in basic technology for building airplanes. Today, we have dramatically better methods for optimizing aerodynamics. We have new materials like carbon fiber composites, and we've completely changed the way we build jet engines. Now they're more fuel efficient and quieter. And it turns out, if you take all these other technologies, and put them together, you can build a new generation supersonic airliner, one that it costs 75% less to operate than Concorde. That means you could buy a ticket New York to London round trip for about $5,000. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, that still sounds really expensive, and it is. But it's about what we pay in business class today, which is a very large market. And I looked at this and thought, man, that's a foothold. That could be a jumping off point for a more mainstream renaissance in speed. So what would we have to do to do this? Well, we'd have to create the first new commercial aircraft startup in 50 years. Excuse me, in 95 years. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? But the reality is that's what it takes. So that's what we decided to take on at my company, Boom. We started working on this seriously about three years ago on the first new supersonic airliner in 50 years. And uh, I'm so proud. We've completed the design of the first prototype. And we're about 18 months away from flying it, right here in Denver. So the prototype is little, but here's the first production aircraft, the boom jet. It seats 55 people. It will take you from New York to London in time to make an afternoon meeting, and home in time to tuck your children into bed. It will save you a whole day round trip across the Atlantic, two days across the Pacific. And thanks to globalization, there's been an explosion in international travel. So that means we can focus on routes like New York to London, San Francisco to Tokyo, Seattle to Shanghai, that are mostly over water, and we need not be blocked by the speed limit. And thanks to progress in fuel efficiency, there's no environmental downside either. The carbon impact is about the same as flying business class subsonic today. So I would like to invite you to imagine with me, in a world where the red-eye flights shrink to just three to four hours, and those excruciating 15, 16, 17-hour hauls become simple overnights, where will you choose to go? There will be new opportunities to experience the people, places, and cultures our planet has to offer. In the supersonic age, the world will quite literally feel smaller. A donor heart could find its way to a recipient 5,000 miles away. Sydney, Australia will feel as accessible as Hawaii is today. World leaders, when they have differences, could gather in the same room to resolve them. My children might get to know their grandpa. Now, I must hasten to say, this is hard, and we still have many challenges ahead. But I'm inspired to go to work every day precisely because the mission is big that we're working on something that will add to the sum of human progress, something that governments and multinational corporations haven't been able to do. We are often told 
as entrepreneurs, as individuals, to think globally, but to act locally, to find a small piece of a big problem which is possible for us to take on. But what if this is bad advice? What if the truth is that individuals and startups can take on big missions and actually succeed? What if the bigger, the more audacious, the more inspiring the mission, actually the greater the odds of success? And a key idea, big ideas attract great people. At Boom, we've been able to build an amazing team from places like SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, and Gulfstream, precisely because we're working on something big and inspiring. And with those kinds of people, a challenge that might seem intractable suddenly becomes possible, even likely. Internally at Boom, we call our first airplane Model A because it's the first step in a long series of aircraft. Over time, we're going to build larger airplanes that are more advanced and more fuel efficient, further driving down the cost of speed. I believe in a future where we can get anywhere in the world in four hours for $100. Now, this is hard, <laughs> but we don't need to break the laws of physics. It's possible, and it's possible in our lifetimes. And when that happens, we will no longer be citizens of a city or country, but we can all simply live on Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you.